At the height of World War II, forces were engaged in what was known as the Battle of the Bulge or the War of 1944. Uh, the fighting there was very fierce and it took place in the winter, so there's a lot of cold and you know, bitter cold and a lot of snow. And uh, the Allied forces had bombed and established control of the strategic area. And uh, the training officer turned to several of his men and said, to, you know, sweep over this area, declare out any soldiers that are remaining. I don't want to take any prisoners. And he emphasized, you know, no prisoners, absolutely none. And uh, one of the American soldiers that were selected to do the attack uh, gave his account. He said, as I walked, I immediately shot and killed two wounded and suffering soldiers. And then suddenly I approached a tall young guy who was leaning against a tree. He wasn't wounded, he was just simply exhausted. He had no food, no water, no comrades in sight, and no ammunition. He said, fear, fatigue, defeat, and loneliness overwhelmed them. And he spoke English with a beautiful accent. Then I noticed a little black Bible in his shirt pocket, and we started to talk about Jesus and salvation. Wouldn't you know it, that lanky German soldier turned out to be a born-again Christian who deeply loved the Lord. I gave him water from my canteen, I even gave him crackers. Then we prayed and read God's word together, and we wept together too. Now the soldier's voice began to tremble as his tears splashed down his cheeks, and his face began to reflect anguish. Seems like only yesterday we stood a foot or so apart as he read it from his German Bible, and I read, it, read Romans 12 from my King James translation. He even showed me a black and white picture of his wife and daughter. The soldier took a deep breath. You see, in those days, I was a young man in my early 20s. He just graduated from a Christian college in Illinois and didn't have time to sort out his thoughts on work. He said, maybe that's why I did what I did. I bid my German brother farewell, took several steps away, and returned to the soldier. As I approached him, Romans 13, the thou shalt not kill commandment, promises of eternal life, the prince of peace, the Sunday school distinction, distinction between killing and murder, and the rationality of war, they all strove in my mind. The German soldier saw me returning, he bowed his head and closed his eyes in the classic prayer posture. Then it happened. I said three crisp sentences that I still repeat once or twice a week when I have nightmares about the war. I said, you're a Christian, I am too. See you later. In less than a second, I transformed that defenseless Christian soldier into a force. Now this is, when I first read this, I was kind of shocked by the story. I, mean, I didn't really expect to end that way. But when you consider what could have happened, had the soldier not followed him over, so you, you know, you see that the most obvious thing is maybe he would have been the one who got shot, or maybe several of the other American soldiers. But uh, it's even another possibility is that the soldier could have rejoined the ranks and revealed location of movements of the Allied forces and you know risk the lives of countless other soldiers. But uh, I've seen a number of movies, Saving Private Ryan, the one that comes to my mind, and. Uh, where you see the exact same situation, and the American soldier sold his mercy and lets the soldier the uh, enemy go. And later on, he's forced to kill the same soldier after he rejoined the ranks and left a whole platoon of people in the ambush. But uh, what I want to look at is was this a case of murder or was it simply carrying out murder? The passage I want to look at today discusses this topic of obedience. It's Colossians 3 22 through 25. It says, Servants and Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord and not unto men. Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. That he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Now I'm sure the soldier didn't enjoy the task of taking life so that he would be in. At the same time, he had been commanded to. So he carried out a devoted verse regardless of personal feelings or emotions. He could have let the soldier go or complained to his superiors that he didn't want to kill him because he wasn't an armed and he was just a defensive soldier and argued for the case of taking prisoners instead of doing what he did. But instead he obeyed and he just he carried out the orders that was given to him. And no matter how high up in the chain he might be, we are all under some form of leadership. I think that even Joe Jordan is under some form of, of uh, authority. In 1 Peter 2, 13 and 15, it says, Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or to governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put the silence and ignorance of foolish men. Now we're expected to answer with the right attitude to those that are in authority over us. 
Um, we're supposed to do this with the attitude of being an example of what Christ would do. Uh, the passage of Colossians says that we are to do everything we do with the attitude that is that we're doing it for the Lord. So what I want to look at today is four elements of obedience. The first one is that we're commanded to obey. Verse 22 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters, according to the flesh, not with eye service and my pleasures, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, the word servants here, or it says slaves in the New American Standard, it doesn't necessarily refer to the kind of slaves you might think of as like the slave labor that was practiced in the U.S. in the early 1800s. But it can also, it can be used in that sense, but it also can refer to like the employer and employee type relationship that is more common today. Um, you know, as I said before, all under some form of authority. And the Bible commands us to respect and obey those that are in authority over us. Um, it even says here that we're not just commanded to do it, but we're even told to want to do it. It says, to do it heartily in the next verse. Uh, we should do all that we do with the intention of serving God and honoring Him rather than just pleasing who we work for. Um, verse says, not with eye service. It means not just doing it for the appearance of just doing it to get it done, but to do it to do it uh, in fear of God and to do it with all our hearts. Uh, the next verse says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily to the Lord and not unto man. Uh, I thought of this verse a lot. I've worked for six years since I've been out of high school. And I ended up doing a lot of jobs that I really don't like. And like I could just kind of do it half heartedly just to get it done. And then I wouldn't have to worry about it. But a lot of times I turn to this verse. Um, it says, with, not the, you know, verse uh, 2 Thessalonians 3 times says, For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if you did not work, neither should you eat. This verse puts it really simply, if you don't work, you don't eat. Um, I personally believe that there are very few exceptions to this. Uh, you know, everyone's capable of making some kind of income. Whether it's like factory work, uh, physical labor, office work, or even something like doing some sort of repair work. You're all commanded to work, and according to this passage of Colossians, no matter what kind of job we do, we're supposed to do it with the attitude to glorifying God. And we're supposed to do it to honor Him, even if you don't like what you're doing, to honor God for doing it. Uh, in the next verse, verse 24, we can see that God is glorified in the Lord. It says, Knowing that of the Lord he shall receive the word of inheritance for this for you serve the Lord Christ. Now according to this verse, God is glorified when we simply obey. Uh, we don't need to do anything spectacularly above or beyond. We just simply need to obey and submit to the authorities of Christ for us. If we don't do this, we see in verse 25, for you serve the Lord Christ. So be, he that doeth wrong shall receive the wrong which he has done, and there is no respect for person. Uh, the first thing that comes to mind when we read this verse in Romans 23, uh, 6 23. It says, The way to sin is death. But another verse I found in the trial of this is do not, do, uh, Romans 6 16. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either sin which leads to death or obedience which leads to righteousness? Uh, I see this as a pretty straightforward verse. If you don't obey those who God has put over us, then we deserve the penalty of sin, which is death. And, uh, fortunately, we know we've all sinned in one form or another. We deserve death. Uh, Christ has provided a way to escape for us uh, through the death of Christ on the cross. And in conclusions, we've seen that uh, as believers would obey the death of those God has placed over us, no matter what, we're supposed to have. Uh, to obey God and uh, to do it for God's glory and uh, seek to honor Him no matter what we do. Uh, in closing, I just want to read a quote. It says, It's a great deal easier to do that which God gives us to do, no matter how hard it is, than to face the responsibilities of not doing it.